Good morning, Year 10. This lesson will be about states of matter and it follows on from our work on density yesterday. In your booklet, this is actually lesson three um, and it comes after calculating density. So to start off with, this piece of work you'll need to do on a spare piece of paper or a little bit of white space in your booklet. What I'd like you to do is to have a think about this shape, this chess piece that is shown in the diagram. The question is that a student wants to find the density of that chess piece and you need to describe a method the student could use. Now remember it's going to be too difficult for the student to use a ruler to measure this piece and work out its volume. So they need to use something different. Then there's a maths question at the bottom about a different chess piece that has a mass of 12 grams and a volume of 6.5 centimetres cubed. You need to calculate its density and give the unit. So pause this video here and spend about five to seven minutes answering this question on a separate piece of paper. So this is the kind of answer that you should have come up with. The student would need to know two pieces of information about the chess piece to be able to calculate its density. They need to know its mass and they need to know its volume. Finding its mass is fairly straightforward. They should use a scale or a balance to measure the mass of the chess piece in grams and record that. They then need to fill a Eureka can with water. I showed you one of these in the lesson yesterday. If you're not quite sure what that is, you could Google it to remind you. Once that can is full of water, they should put the object into the Eureka can and collect the water that is displaced. The volume of water, which they can tell by reading off the measuring cylinder, that has been displaced will be equal to the volume of the chess piece. So for example, if 20 centimetres cubed of water had been displaced, that tells the student that the chess piece has a volume of 20 centimetres cubed. They can then use the formula P equals M over V to calculate the density of the chess piece and just substitute in their values from their investigation. The maths question I'd given you at the bottom gave you values for the mass and the volume of a different chess piece. And if you substituted those into your equation, P equals M divided by V, you would have gotten an answer of 1.85 grams per centimetre cubed. So moving on to today's lesson, we're going to talk about the three states of matter. You'll recognise these from lower down the school. We're going to talk about how the particles are arranged and also why that means that gases are less dense than solids and than liquids. So the three pictures on the screen here you should recognise as representations of the three states of matter. Now in these descriptions I'm going to be talking about particles. In this topic particles might refer to atoms, to ions or to molecules but I'm just going to use the word particles to describe each of these uh, circles in the diagram. So in a solid the particles are held in fixed positions. There are forces of attraction between them holding them there. They can't move, they can only vibrate. So they, they stay in their position, their shape is fixed. A liquid, the particles are still in contact with each other, they're still touching each other because there are still strong forces of attraction between each particle but they can move about. They move in random directions and they can move over each other. So liquids have a fixed volume. It doesn't matter what uh, sort of container you pour a liquid into, it will always occupy the same volume, but you can change its shape. If you imagine a tall measuring cylinder and a short beaker, you could pour a full measuring cylinder into the beaker and it would change its shape, but not its volume. Finally, in a gas, the particles are much further apart. They move much, much faster as well. They have more energy. The forces between these particles are very weak. In terms of energy, particles in a gas have much more energy. They're moving much faster. In a solid, they have less energy. So it's very common in exams for you to be asked to use that idea of kinetic and particle theory of solids, liquids and gases to explain different properties. So this is a question from an exam paper, it's six marks. It says the information in the box is about the properties of solids and gases. And they've told us that solids have a fixed shape and they are difficult to compress. And gases will spread and fill the entire container and they are easy to compress. 
The question is to use your knowledge of kinetic theory to explain the information given in the box. Kinetic theory is what we've looked at on the previous slide, so how the particles are arranged in solids, liquids and gases, and how they move. They've given you a few pointers here. It says you should consider the spacing between the particles, the movement of individual particles, and the forces between the particles. So I'd like you to pause the video here and to write down on a piece of paper how you would answer this question. So they want you to use what you know about kinetic theory, the spacing, the movement, the forces between those particles to explain why solids have a fixed shape and are difficult to compress and why gases will spread and fill the entire container and are easy to compress. So pause the video here, give yourself about seven or eight minutes to answer this question separately on a piece of paper and then come back and we'll go through the mark scheme. Okay. So hopefully you have an answer in front of you now for this question. This is the model answer and I'll talk you through it. In these six mark questions, it's a good idea to plan your answer. So whilst you don't need to write an essay plan like you would in English, you need to have some sort of idea of how you're going to structure your answer. I've chosen to talk about the solid first and then the gas. So I've started my answer by saying that in a solid, the particles are packed closely together with strong forces holding them. They can't move, and that explains why they have a fixed shape. The particles are touching, that means that there's no space between them, so they can't be compressed or squashed any closer together. So in my first two bullet points, I have explained the first two properties that they've given me in the box in the question. In the second two bullet points, I've done the same, but for the properties of the gas. So in a gas, the particles will move in all directions. There's very weak forces holding them together, and therefore the gases can spread out and fill the container that they're in. There's also a lot of space between the particles in gases, so those particles can be compressed or squashed closer together. And that would be a perfect six mark answer. So when we talk about changing things between these states, there are different words for the changes and you can see them on this diagram. Changing a solid into a liquid is called melting. Changing a liquid back into a solid is called solidifying or freezing. Changing a liquid into a gas is either called evaporation or boiling and changing a gas into a liquid is condensation. You can also skip the liquid stage altogether and turn a solid directly into a gas. That's called sublimation. Very, very few chemicals or substances do that. Most will go to a liquid first and then change into a gas. If you cool a gas down, it can turn back into a solid. So these changes of state are changing the amount of energy that the particles have. So by heating a solid, we're giving the particles more energy. That means they're going to move more and eventually they'll turn into a liquid. In a liquid, if we heat those particles, eventually the forces between the particles will be overcome. The particles will be moving much more quickly and the substance turns into a gas. So as we change state, we're changing the arrangement of the particles and we're changing how much energy the particles have. So remember, in a solid, the particles have least energy. In a gas, they have most energy. Our diagram on the previous slide showed us why gases will be less dense than solids and liquids. Density is a measure of how much mass is in a certain volume. In a gas, the particles are so far apart that there are very few of them in a certain volume. Therefore, the gas is less dense. Now I'd like you to turn to page 87 of your workbook and to attempt the questions there on this topic. I'll be looking at my emails throughout your lesson. So if you've got any questions about this or if you're not sure on the questions on page 87, drop me an email and I'll get back to you.